Welcome to It's All About the Questions, where learning to ask the right questions can help you achieve lifelong success. Now, here to help you ask all the right questions is award-winning author, international speaker, and business strategist, Laura Stewart. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone, and welcome, welcome, welcome to the show. It is a joy to be here with you this week. It is a beautiful day here in Vero Beach, Florida. I don't know what the weather is like for any of you, wherever you are listening to, because this show is listened to all over the world. Um, and for those of you listening live on iHeartRadio, thank you for listening live. It's always so much fun to know that you're out there, and thank you for all the emails and social media posts and reach outs that you do after each show to let me know what you've learned and what you thought about the show. And today I've got a, a really unique guest for you. Uh, some of you know that I'm known as a business strategist. I do a lot of work with clients who often want to leave their day jobs, as they call them. They're working corporate or they're working retail or they're working some other job, but they really want to become an entrepreneur. They, they love Shark Tank. They love all of that stuff, and they want to start their own businesses. So they're trying to figure out how to create their own business as a side gig to start and eventually turn that side gig that they're doing as they're making their salary on their day job into a full-time business. And I've got a great guest today. He reached out to me, and I just love everything I've learned about him, so I had to have him on the show. I've got Tommy Griffith on the phone here with me, and he's the founder of ClickMinded. But if you've ever heard of us, two small companies called Airbnb and PayPal, he did the SEO for them to help them get to where they are today. So he's going to be with us today talking about how you can – Start your side project and, you know, turn it into your full-time gig. So, Tommy, thanks for reaching out and thanks for being here. Laura, thanks so much for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. It's really exciting because, you know, it's the most asked question that I get when I'm working with clients. Can I help them turn their side hustle, their side gig into a full-time job? And I can't tell you how often... That halfway through, like, our 100-day process that I take them through, they're like, I didn't know it was going to be this much work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the um, I think one of the most fascinating things I learned through the whole process and many, many uh, additional side projects that failed was uh, this concept that's flying around entrepreneurial circles now called the 1,000-day rule. Um the basic idea is it takes about a thousand days to get your side project up to the point where it's replacing your full-time income. And for a lot of people, that's brutal. (laughs) It's about three years. Um, And especially in this world where there's so many people, uh, you know, social media influencers and blog posts and um, entrepreneurial sort of like, uh, walkthroughs and things like that, that that give you this illusion that uh that everyone everyone's an overnight success, and uh, and that all you need to do is this all you need to do is buy this one course or this one ebook and it can be yours too, right? And the the brutal reality is, um, it takes about a thousand days to 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 uh to bring your side project to the point where it's replacing your income. So uh, it doesn't surprise me at all that if you're doing if you're doing mentorship or calls with people over a hundred day period and they, they just sort of look at you and say like, why aren't I a billionaire yet? That's, <laughs> that's, uh, that's not a big surprise to me at all. Yeah. And it's fascinating. I love this idea of the thousand day rule. I had not heard that before. What I always knew is that the average business fails within five years yep. and never makes it to the next stage. They sort of yep. struggle along, go through roller coaster rides throughout there, and never get beyond the struggle. They may have a good year or two in the middle of there, and then something falls apart. So that's really interesting that this thousand day rule of going from a side gig to to full time. Now you've lived that <laughs> multiple times in trying to build your click minded and some other things that you were doing while traveling 
and doing the nomadic entrepreneurial thing. I don't know how you did that, Tommy, because it's hard yeah. enough staying in one place. Yeah, um, yeah, it, it's been it's been uh, quite a wild ride. I think um, I think a lot of the so moving back a little bit, part part of my motivation was actually um, debt. And more specifically, being absolutely miserable and and, and being in debt. I uh, I graduated university um, at the height of the recession, and uh, had started a got really interested in, in internet marketing. And a friend of mine and I ended up um, starting a a business when I was very young. I was twenty two years old, and that business failed miserably. <laughs> and we uh, I, the one upside was we learned internet marketing, but man, we just did everything wrong and I was one of these people who was was very fortunate I uh my my parents paid for university I was very blessed and I'm one of the few people who graduated college with no debt and ended up putting myself into debt with this business idea borrowed money from family and friends we worked on it for a year and it didn't work it was it was a, a pretty rough failure um and yeah, yeah, came home, like tail between my legs, pretty sad, knocked on the door and was like, hey, mom, hey, dad, remember me? <laughs> remember your son? Is there, is there room on that couch, right? And um, so uh, I, I learned a lot of internet marketing and ended up uh, just kind of being right place, right time with at, at PayPal. And at the time, PayPal was hiring an, an SEO manager and ended up turning it uh, into a job. Um, what's that called? Like, failing up or something, I guess, but, uh, but, um, I was very motivated on the side to also pay off all the debt that I, that I'd had. And so, uh, that was sort of the, the catalyst for quick minded was, was, you know, I had, I had done the first company attempt, failed miserably, learned enough to turn it into a new job, but also wanted to start this side project to pay down all that debt I had put myself into. And so it's really interesting, uh, what, you know, when you think about if you're working on a side project now, if you're sitting at home listening and you're working on a side project, I've actually found, um, you know, counterintuitively that the more, and this is really a brutal pill to swallow, but the more comfortable you are now, the less likely, at least among my friends and family and people that have asked me, I find that the more comfortable you are now, kind of the lower likelihood um, you are to succeed and to make the jump. And part of that is because you don't want to give up what you have, right? Maybe, maybe you're okay with your job or your salary is pretty good or, or something like that. But I was in the situation where I was in debt and I was miserable. And I kind of was backed into a corner a little bit. And, and looking back, um, that was one of my big motivators in order to, uh, to work on this thing so hard and, and to get out of the, the problem I had, I had caused myself. You know what I mean? All right, well, let's, let's talk about that, the whole idea of the motivator. To go from a side gig, something that you're sort of doing on the side, like now I started my tech services company back in 1994. I had been on the side helping friends out and some uh, different people that I knew with computer problems, right? I have a degree in computer science, all this other stuff. I, you know, I had every certification possible from every major manufacturer. So I was, you know, hey, can you help me with this? Yeah, sure, whatever, I'll help you. Fix the computers, get networks running, whatever. I did that in my corporate job as well. And I never thought of doing it as a business until the company I was working for, Pitney Bowes, offered a package. And it was like, oh, okay, well, let me see if I can make a go of it because I'm going to get six months' pay and a year's medical benefits. Can't ask for anything better, right? And it was during the heyday of, you know, tech people could write their own ticket for anything that they wanted to do. So, And I never looked back for 15 years. But that's not the normal scenario. So this idea of motivation for me, it was, oh, well, let me try it. But that's not how it works for most people. It has to be something really driving. For you, it was getting out of debt. How do people, in your mind, from what you've seen, get something that motivates them for more than five minutes? Yeah, for sure. It was a really good question, Laura. And actually, 
I'm curious with you. Okay, so you had you you kind of had the right place, right time with an offer from your old company. But were you personally motivated by the tech services stuff, or were you just good at it, or did you just see it as an opportunity and you wanted like more personal freedom? What was, what was your motivation? Well, my motivation was funny. You're turning the questions on me. Um, <laughs> it's I all about the questions, astronaut. Laura. It's all about the questions. It is. Okay. It is. And I originally wanted to be an astronaut, so that's why I went into tech. And tech was easy to me. It was very simple. I, I didn't even have to think about it. It was like my mind was programmed to fix this stuff, to understand it. And... I took a side gig when I got my master's degree in management and organizational behavior to doing team skills and um, all of that kind of stuff and and helping grow organizational behavior things. Hated it. Couldn't wait to get back to the tech, which made way more sense to me. And now it's really funny because I I do strategy and consulting work, which is we can all do this if we work together. But (laughs) um, (laughs) So for me, starting my own business in tech, it just made sense. It was just a simple aside, and because I already had some people I was doing some work for, I just put feelers out, and next thing you know, the business was flying in. But that's not how it normally works. Yeah, that that, that makes a lot of sense. So, um, yeah, so it ended up being a very similar situation with me as well, and I was, you know, I was interested in entrepreneurship and generally motivated to, to start a business, but... Um, you know, ClickMinded is, is now my, my full-time business. I, but like, like you mentioned, I spent two years managing SEO at PayPal and four years managing SEO at Airbnb. And over the last two years now, I've gone full-time on this. But ClickMinded, what, you know, we have a small team now. The company's been growing, and it's, it's been great. But um, ClickMinded was probably, like, idea number 15 <laughs> for me. I tried a lot of, a lot of different things. And uh, I had a lot of entrepreneurial ADD and uh, a, a lot of entrepreneurial neuroticism. And I think, uh, I think there's, a, there's, a, there's an interesting balance here because my business now didn't really, didn't really start to take off until I really focused on it. There's a funny way to test how, how much entrepreneurial ADD you have if your audience is more um, tech-oriented or tech-minded or there's a, you know, future Internet entrepreneurs listening, uh, the funny way to test this is to go to your web hosting account and see how many unused domains you have. <laughs> oh, there. I've got a few of those. <laughs> and I bet you do. I bet you do. And so the more, the more domains you have in there, the more entrepreneurial ADD you have. Um, and, I, and I had a lot. But, but the, big, um, the big factor for me, what ultimately ended up working, and it's kind of similar to your story, but being super motivated by it. So, for example, like one of the ideas uh, prior to the, the one that worked was, you know, I had this, I, I, and again, I was working for someone and wanted to pay off my debt faster and was trying to figure something out. And I had this idea for an iPhone app development lead generation site. And the idea was, okay, it was 2011. Um, iOS development was getting really, really big. Any company that didn't already have an iOS app wanted one. Uh, a lot of developers and engineers were starting to learn Xcode, the language you need to create um, iPhone apps. And my basic idea was like, okay, I'm going to get a, a new website ranking for, you know, iPhone app developer costs and iPhone app development companies and these kinds of things, and then maybe sell the leads, right? And so I created this site. I got a ranking in Google. I started generating traffic. It all started to work, and I just, hated it. Like I, I just hated the business. And, you know, whenever I woke up on the Saturday mornings, like I did a full week of work. And when I woke up on Saturday morning to work, to work on it, I just could not get out of bed. I was just not personally motivated by it. I wasn't interested in it. It just wasn't, wasn't fun for me. Um, what was so fun for me was SEO. I, I love search engine optimization and I love teaching it too. And, um, I think, you know, I played a lot of computer games as a kid, and, and I, I think what happened was SEO to me felt like and feels like my computer games as a kid, like making traffic go up and making rankings go up and, and you know, watching it go all, all up in your, on your dashboard. But it just, my, my vice moved from, like, video games as a kid to 
this particular type of very nerdy, very technical skill, um, combined with the fact that I love to, to teach. So the, the business, the first evolution of the business was a physical in-person class, right? I started physically teaching um, search engine optimization to start up on the weekends in San Francisco, right? And kind of Saturday morning, all day, all you can SEO. So like 9, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. physically teaching people um, in class. Right. The difference, the difference was that, and you know, there's this guy, there's this very prolific uh, tech venture capitalist named Naval Ravikant. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, but he, he's got this, this way to think about what you work on where he says, what looks like work to other people should feel like play to you. And the basic premise is that you can develop an unfair advantage by working on what you love, working on what feels like play. And, and, and his basic concept is that if you're working 16 hours a day and it, it's work to everyone else and it's play to you, you're going to win over the long term. Nobody can beat you if you're just doing what feels like play to you. So super long-winded answer to your question, but it sounds to me like, um, the organizational behavior stuff was work for you and the tech stuff was play for you and that kind of makes all the difference. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Because for me doing the tech stuff, which is probably why I'm, I'm back and forth nowadays of, you know, what does my business look like, is, you know, it's just easy for other people. My first gig that I got through a contracting company, they took me into uh, – a really large Fortune 50 company that had been having some troubles, and they, I, I failed the interview miserably because I couldn't remember that this is back in the days when DOS was still there and Novell and everything. And nice. he's like, well, can you tell me what the different components of, of memory are on a computer? And this is back when it was really important and all that. And, I, I, you know, I just bungled it, and I said, look, I, don't, I can't define it for you, but I can tell you I know how to manipulate it. So I think the guy just felt, let me put her in to prove that I'm smarter than her. And they sat me down in front of the worst situations they had ever seen, the problems that these computers have had for over a year. And in five minutes, I fixed every one of them. And he had brought his director in to watch me fail, basically. And, you know, I blew them all away. And they're like, well, how do you know this? I'm like, I do this every day. This is just what I do. And, it, you know, you don't think about it. But that, for a lot of entrepreneurs, they keep going, well, the money is here, the money is there, I have to be doing that. And they don't see how something that to them is play can become a business. So how do you answer mm. that for them? How do you help them go, this is actually what my business should be, this is the question I should ask to help me figure out what that is? Mm. Yeah, it's a really good point. And, um, you know, there's a really interesting trope out there right now in Silicon Valley around markets. I think it was uh, Mark Andreessen or, uh, yeah, I think it was Mark Andreessen, who's another prolific kind of tech venture capitalist guy. He, he's got this quote around markets. He says, like, I'd rather have a mediocre product and a mediocre team in a great market than a than a great product and a great team in a mediocre market, and there's this kind of um, there's this you know movement around people sort of under underestimating and undervaluing the importance of like being in the right space. And while that may be true for these you know massive industry like titans of industry kind of guys and like um, people making hundreds of millions and billions of dollar investments. Uh, I disagree when it comes to starting a side project, right? When you're talking about your first 10,000 in revenue or your first 100,000 in revenue or whatever it is, whatever your goals are, the single most important factor is you and more specifically your own personal interest in this thing. You're the engine that's going to drag this thing across the finish line to the first, the first goal post, right? It's, it's, it's all on you. And uh, it doesn't really matter uh, <laughs> how, how great the market is if you can't get to the first $1,000 or $10,000 or, or whatever it is. You are the engine that drives this. And so while I think those, like, more meta 
macro ideas around the markets are, I guess, are important for bigger companies. If you're trying to, um, you know, bring your life out up to the next stage or, or, or move out of your job or work on your side project, um, your own personal interest in it is everything. It is the engine that's going to get you there first. So I think people get a little bit too quantitative around this. They do, yeah, what you just said, like, where's the money, right? Or, or how, what's the total addressable market? Or what are people willing to pay for this? And a way better question is to um, step back a little bit and be like, what do I love to do? Like, where, where, where do I have an unfair advantage? Where, uh, where can I work on things where to other people it's, it's work and to me it's just play? You know what I mean? I, I do, and, and that's really a great question. So let's say it one more time to everybody, Tommy, so correct me if I didn't get this right. So where can I enter business that's play for me but is work for other people so I can help them make it play? Is that a good way of phrasing that? That's, yeah. Uh, say that one more time. I don't know if I can. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. Well, I think just like a very simple way to say it is um, what feels like play to me that's work to other people. Okay. But then take it to the next level. So somebody's figured out what's play to them and work to other people. And then how do they turn that to make it so that what's work to other people goes monetary? Because yeah, so for, for some people, right. what's play is, you know, they, they like to just, um, they like to garden, okay? And for other people, it's work, but they don't necessarily want to start a landscaping business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, um, so I think this question is, is the, the most important, right? What, uh, what, what out there is play to me that feels like work to other people? But once you start there and once you have that, from there, you can go back to the more boring stuff around being more quantitative around it and do, doing total addressable market sizing and things like that. So I, I love search engine optimization, and I, I, I use SEO to do a lot of this, and I really love this idea of using keyword research to, to, to figure out what kind of business to work on. I don't know how, uh, like how deep we want to go, especially just – um, like over the phone, over audio on keyword research. But the basic idea is, right, in search engine optimization, we're doing everything we can to rank at the top of search engines like Google or YouTube or Pinterest or, or, or whatever it is. And we use third-party tools to figure out how frequently people are searching for things, right? So um, when you have an idea like that, right, around gardening or whatever it is, you can, you can use search engine uh, – it's called search query volume, basically how many times a month are people searching for a particular term. You can use a lot of this stuff to figure out demand, to figure out what people want, right? And so you can figure out, in my case, it was how many people are typing in SEO training San Francisco, right? But for someone else, it might be, you know, if you, if you love, uh, you know, baking vegan food, it might be vegan, vegan carrot cake recipes or, or things like that, right? Or, or, uh, you know, organic gardening tactics, Southern Florida, right, or, or whatever it is. And, and uh, so I think the first question is the most important, which is around where are your natural advantages, where are your unfair advantages, what feels and like And hold right there, you? hold right there, because that's a really great question, but we only have a few seconds before <laughs> national news cuts in. So I want to make sure that we cover that going in, in the, the next half of, of the show. So we're here with Tommy Griffiths founder of ClickMinded, former head of SEO at PayPal and Airbnb, a brilliant man, and we're talking about how you start, how you turn your side project into a full-time gig. And we'll be back with him some more talking about that and how you can too. And he's going to talk some more about keyword research and, and how you can turn what you find is play for you and is work for other people into your business. So um, I really love that question. So during the break, think about what is play for you and work for other people. We'll be right back. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. We're here with Tommy Griffith, founder of ClickMinded.com. By the way, go there. Lots of great information up there. Former CEO, SEO, excuse me, at PayPal and Airbnb, we've been talking about how you turn your side project into 
your dream job, becoming an entrepreneur. And just before the break, Tommy, you started talking about this whole idea of keyword research and how once you've answered the question, what is play for me and work for other people, and said, okay, I'm going to try to start a business doing this, then you get into the nuts and bolts because it's more than just a passion. It has to have a business behind it. For sure. And and that's um, that's the more traditional kind of stuff around, yeah, we call it like total addressable market sizing, but it's just a fancy way to say, how can you solve other people's problems, right? Um, the uh, Another really kind of underrated part of this whole aspect, and you know, we're talking about keyword research, which is the this idea that you can use third-party tools to figure out search volume. So how many, how many people a month are going to Google and typing in vegan carrot cake recipes or, you know, uh, used cars, uh, Tallahassee, Florida, or um, how do I make my marriage better, right? Like all, all these kinds of things people are Googling and, and how can you figure out their problems. But even before that, um, one really important aspect around this is also diving into your customer avatars, right? You kind of do this in tandem with your, your keyword research. So once you've sort of figured out what you love to do, what, 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 what's play to you and work to other people, getting really, really dialed into who, who your customer avatars are and what they're uh, searching for and, and, and hammering that really, really hard um, is extremely valuable. I think one, one big mistake that people make and this is very much related to the thousand day rule we were talking about earlier, which is this idea that you need about a thousand days to get your side project up to whatever your current income is. One big mistake a lot of people make when they're, when they're starting their side project is, and it's very reasonable, it's understandable, but the mistake they make is they, it's all about them. It's all about, you know, Hey everyone, like think about how great my life is going to be when, uh, you know, when I start, to, when I go full time on my, my side project or when I start this side project. And the reality is, you know, the first thousand days of entrepreneurship are mostly about getting your butt kicked, right? It's mostly yeah. about solving other people's problems and, uh, and, and taking it on the chin and getting, get it, getting, getting knocked, knocked down a bunch, right? And so, uh, a lot of people, aren't prepared for this when they start their side project is it's all about them. And the reality is you have to figure out where your unfair, in my opinion, you have to figure out where your unfair advantage is and then figure out who your customer avatars are and what problems you can solve for them. And then mostly just serve, mostly just fix other people's problems and get beat up for a little while. And that's, that's a lot of the game. A lot of people don't want to hear that, but that's a lot of the game. You know what I mean? I, I do, and during the n- news break at the half hour mark, you and I were talking about you know how I had started my business, and I said, you know, it was so much easier back when I started my business. You know, Tim Ferriss wasn't out there talking about the four hour work week. None of this stuff was out there. Tony Robbins was still around. I mean, I did a fire walk on the streets of Manhattan um, ages ago when nice. it was called the fire walk versus uh, whatever he calls it now, and. But now everybody wants to do business not locally and regionally. They want to do business on the Internet. They want to ha- do Internet marketing. They want to, like you did, you you didn't have any one base of business. I mean, you were in Bali. You were in uh, Spain. You were all over the place. Every few months you would get up and move to another place while you're trying to start a business. And everybody's goal is, oh, I only work four hours a week, and they, they figure that's the way they can start. Now, when I started my business, Tommy, I was working 80 to 100 hours a week, and that continued for years until I brought on staff, and, and then even then, I still kind of worked that way. So in, in this new paradigm of work, everybody thinks, they can just make it big right away <laughs> while just doing business on the Internet without right. necessarily having a thing. How do you right. respond to that? Yeah, and um, it's, it's really funny. First of all, the, 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 the greatest uh, clickbait of all time is Tim Ferriss, the title of Tim Ferriss' book, The 4-Hour Workweek, because there is no such thing as a four hour work week. Um, even, even, uh, 
even Tim Ferriss admits he's never really had a four-hour work week. That guy works 80 hours a week, which is I, I don't I don't fault him at all for titling the book that way, but it, it sets expectations pretty crazy for people getting into this. Um, and besides, most people, this is sort of why, back to the original point of why you should figure out what feels like play for you and not for work. It's most people want to play for more than four hours a week, right? So, right. Um, so that's, that's sort of a funny um, conclusion there. But, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's true. People are all expecting the end result immediately, and they, it's all centered around them with their side project. How can I uh, change my life and, and sort of do this thing? And, I, I, yeah, I was very lucky. I uh, built a remote business, have remote staff, and did get to travel for uh, over the last two years quite a lot, which was great. But um, it was it was it was not right away. It's really funny, you know. I'm super happy with the business now. It's it, it's doing great now. But we're on year eight. I'm like we are eight years in now, and um, you could also argue, even though you know, on a year by year basis, like right now this year we're doing great. You could also argue that this business has been a massive failure. I mean, you can, and I listed this in a blog post I wrote recently about how the last two years have gone. I, I, li- I listed out all the revenue numbers for my company and it looks good in isolation, but then I also listed a bunch of companies that were started after me. Right. And like, you know, it's like Lyft, $24 billion, Snapchat, $15 billion, Instacart, $7 billion. Right. So you could also argue that, that my business is a complete failure because it's just this dinky little, you know, cash flow like uh, lifestyle business. But the, 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 the thing that everyone misses is that it's, I'm eight years in, right? And a lot of people that are just starting their, their side project, they want the results right away. But the reality is you have to spend most of your, the, the, the first phase of the business solving other people's problems and getting your butt kicked and, and figuring it out and figuring out where you can be valuable. And so a lot of that's hard work and it's, 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 to be frank, it's not that sexy to talk about. It's not that sexy to talk about how, uh, how, how awful it's going to be the first couple of years. And so a lot of people are very shocked when they come to that conclusion. Well, you mentioned lifestyle business. And some people would have said that my tech company that I started was a lifestyle business. And I've always taken offense to that because I built a business and sold it. It paid for my lifestyle and then the business has been sold multiple times since I sold it. So obviously there is some value in all of that. Not everybody needs to be a Lyft or a PayPal or an Airbnb. Their business is a business to enable them to live their life and and have the retirement of their dreams, or if they're playing, they never retire. So why is lifestyle business such a dirty word? Because most people... In these side gigs, it's you know it's going to be their their career, their job. I recently worked with a client who's an environmental biologist, and he's also an amazing photographer. And I've been working with him to help his side gig of a photographer become his professional full time job. And there's nothing wrong with it, but yet everybody's like, no, you have to grow it into these huge businesses. You have to have an eight-figure business. Do you? What's your thought on that? Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, and it's coming up a lot more now, which, is, which has been really, really fascinating. Uh, the, the basic premise is that anything, any business that's under $20 million in revenue is described as a lifestyle business in a pejorative way, right? Like it's kind of a, uh, you know, no matter what you're doing, if, if you're like under $20 million or so in revenue, it's like, oh, cute, cute little lemonade stand you have there. What, what else do you got? <laughs> you know? That's crazy. And, uh, and, there's this, and there's this whole movement now of people that are laughing in the face of this, um, especially with, I mean, I don't know how, like, deep you want to go on this, but there's all these stories now of um, how taking on funding and uh, venture capital money and growing things to the next phase that satisfy investors ruins, uh, you know, company founders' lives, 
right? It's like they don't, they suddenly don't realize that they don't want 0.1% of a way bigger company. They, they just want to um, do what they want to do. And there has been this movement around uh, sort of changing the vocabulary around it. Um, this guy, Hitton Shah, someone I follow on Twitter, he's awesome. He, he, he tweeted this out once. He said, let me lay this to rest. Uh, people don't bootstrap their businesses. They self-fund them. People don't have lifestyle businesses. They have cash flow businesses. And so there is kind of this movement around uh, people being like, hey, wait a minute. What is all this for? What, why do we have to grow to infinity? Why, why, why is the goal to be a Google or a Facebook or a, a, a whatever it is? Um, why can't, why can't we just create, you know, vehicles that, that give us way more awesome lives that, that let's unlock, uh, certain, certain things we want to do in our lives and, uh, and let it ride, you know? Uh, and so I personally haven't, haven't, uh, had a problem with this at all. I, I, uh, I'm very comfortable calling my business a lifestyle business. It's, it's very much my scene. But a lot of people, they do take it a little bit personally, and they they um, they want it to be viewed as a more legitimate thing. So it, it kind of depends. But yeah, it's 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 funny to me that um, if you're not for some reason, the criteria is you need to make investors and venture capitalists and and all these other people happy. And I think it's way easier to just step back and be like, wait a minute, why why do I why do I have to make you guys happy? Uh, why can't I just do this for myself, you know? Well, uh, that's an important question that anybody who's starting a side gig, a side project, and wants to go into a full-time job, I think, needs to be asking themselves, where do they want it to go? I mean, are there other questions that you've learned over time that have helped you realize, you know, here's where you want your business to reach? Do you know where you want your business to grow to, Tommy? Have you talked about that, thought about that? Yeah, we, um, we, we have, uh, it's actually less about revenue at this point now and more about some of the other things going on in the world. We're actually personally very motivated with, uh, around the, the student debt crisis and around kind of secondary education in general, my, my now co-founder, um, and I, we, uh, there's just a bunch of problems that we want to solve that we think our business is now able to solve. For example, there's there's 50 universities in the U.S. that offer a master's degree in digital marketing, uh, and to be frank, they are garbage. They are they are completely useless products. No one in no one in a, a respectable tech company would ever consider these degrees. But these massive universities are manipulating and tricking young kids into thinking they need a fifty thousand dollar degree. Right, the vast majority of people that get into digital marketing. They teach themselves or they take online courses or whatever, but these universities are, um, are, are manipulating kids into thinking they need a master's degree in social media, you know, which is frankly outrageous. So that's kind of one, one sort of uh, benchmark we have around what we want to do next. Uh, another benchmark is just around the size of the company. We've actually said that we don't like have a revenue goal where we say, okay, once we hit X number of revenue, we want to sell. <laughs> our only our only metric for when we want to sell is if we ever need HR. <laughs> if we we know we're really really bad at at uh, HR and like paperwork and all this and and the basic idea is like if we get big enough to the point where we need an HR department, we'll probably just give it to someone else and then go work on something else, right? So it's kind of like a it's just like yeah, knowing what we like to do and enjoy working on and then setting parameters around that. And then once the business gr- grows to a point where um, we're not good at it anymore, uh, then we're, we'll probably, you know, give it to someone else. Because it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's kind of the back to what I said before, it's around playing. It's just around having fun. We're having so much fun with it right now. So why stop? And then the minute it gets boring or the minute it becomes something that we're not good at, give it to someone else and, and start over, I guess, you know? But yet, the research I did says it's not just play for you guys. <clears throat> you looked at the actual business. You understand the numbers of your business. You understand the marketing of your business. You understand the staffing, the clients. 
So it's not just about, oh, I'm just going to keep playing. Part of that play is some serious business questions you guys ask yourselves. Yes or no? Yeah. And if it's no, that's okay. In, in terms of growing, yeah, for sure. I mean, we, the business is definitely working. Um, but as an example, we have said no to a ton of different opportunities because uh, we didn't like them or we weren't good at them or both. Uh, we, we've actually relentlessly said no to a lot of different things that we don't want to do because we think, yeah, not only do we not enjoy doing it, but we think well, our results will be pretty mediocre. Um, and so, yeah, we, we have a good understanding of what people need, but we don't solve all their problems. We're, we're, we're just sort of solving the things where we have an unfair advantage and, and that we enjoy doing. And it just makes life so much easier. Uh, and, and I've done both before. I've taken on product where it's just like, okay, relentless pursuit of revenue above all else. I've tried that in the early days of it. And um, I was measurably more miserable, for sure. I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm not trying to do some high and mighty thing where uh, I'm, 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 it's like a, like a holier than now thing where I just, I, uh, I, I, I reject revenue left, right, and center. I, I, I do see a, an advantage that in the early days, especially to get some early growth, but things start to really hum. In my opinion, things have started to really hum when we got real, really dialed into our customer avatars, really dialed into our users problems and focused exclusively on things where we only had an unfair advantage and just uh, continue to pour time, money, effort and resources into that. And do, doing that over, over eight years combined with the fact that it all feels like play it kind of has to work at that point, right? You just, you, the, the basic idea is like you're kind of stacking the deck in your own favor as much as possible. And it eventually, as long as you keep, keep at it, it eventually kind of has to work. That's a really good point, Tommy, because I've just seen that happen so many times with entrepreneurs I worked with and other business owners, like when I started my company, they focused so much on just revenue that they forgot all the other pieces and without those other pieces, the revenue is not going to happen for more than a moment. So you've right. built this base that it's what your clients want. So the money's going to come in because it's what they want. Right. And so many for entrepreneurs sure. forget about that. <laughs> they're just focused on, on the number, on the money. And then next thing you know, they're in this dip and a dive because – there's their clients don't want it anymore. They've lost focus on, on who their clients are. And, and, you know, we're not at the end of the show yet, but we're getting too close for comfort, as I call it. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I could talk to you for hours. I wanted to talk to you about this whole nomadic business that you had and everything, but I also want to make sure that people know how to reach you and find out to you about you and ask you any questions that they may have. So what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? Yeah, um, you can find us at clickminded.com, uh, on Twitter, I'm at Tommy Griffith. And at ClickMinded, we have a bunch of, if you're, if you're interested in digital marketing and uh, you're, you're, uh, you're not really sure where to start, we have some pretty often free digital marketing strategy guides and SEO strategy guides that, that you can check out there. Okay, so clickminded.com, and what was the other way to reach you? Yeah, on Twitter, I'm at Tommy Griffith. Okay, great. And I'll, as everybody knows, I'll also have ways to link to you from, from the blog post up on the show website and stuff as well. Some last thoughts you'd like to share with my, my listeners about anything that we've been talking about, side gigs, you know, your struggle. I know you've, you've reinvented yourself just with this business multiple times. Yeah, I think the one big takeaway um, that a lot of people uh, miss out on, and I did this accidentally, and then someone, uh, a friend of mine who writes a lot about entrepreneurship, uh, wrote very articulately about what this was, and I think people should consider it. Um, there's this concept now in a lot of these Internet businesses and in entrepreneurship called exit velocity. 
And I highly recommend thinking about this if you're at a job where you're about to to uh, to jump ship from. So the idea is that um, there's too many people who don't use any of the advantages they have in their current job on their next gig. You know, as you alluded to at the beginning of the show, most businesses fail within five years. That's absolutely true. The basic trope is startups are hard and most startups fail. And so uh, anything you can do prior to leaving to stack the deck in your favor is really, really valuable. So I'm just pulling up the definition here. So exit velocity is the amount of professional and entrepreneurial momentum you have when quitting your job and starting a new venture. Momentum can come from a variety of sources, investment, capital, experience, anchor clients, industry knowledge, and connections, a.k.a. unfair advantage. So the idea here is like there's, there's a lot of people, you know, maybe they're a lawyer and they've been in law school and they've been a lawyer for 20 years and then they're about to go jump to their new side project and they're selling like CrossFit jump ropes on Amazon, right? And there's just no, they're sort of starting over, right? Now, don't get me wrong. If you love CrossFit and you love jump ropes and you want to do this and you're passionate about it, of course, go do it. But uh, you're starting over. And this was, you know, my first business, I had no velocity. I had no connections. I had no interest in it. I had no prior experience. And, of course, I failed. But with my second one, I was managing search engine optimization at two of the biggest websites in the world. And then on the side, I was teaching search engine optimization. And then at work, I was using my own product on my colleagues, right? And I sort of was building that credibility. Then I was building that business while I was working. And so the amount of exit velocity I had on the second try was really, really high. And so it's just one thing to think about uh, when you're considering this is to think about, okay, someone's currently paying you. You know, you probably have some credibility at work. You probably have things you're working on. You probably have ways you could use your side business in, in work. Think about that and think about developing your own unfair advantage before you leave. That is, that's absolutely brilliant because most people feel they have to do something completely different. What was so successful with my first business was it was stuff I was doing. I, I knew it like the back of my hand, and I knew there was a need for it out there. I didn't try to sell CrossFit jump ropes. CrossFit wasn't even a thing back in the 90s. So. <laughs> God, I feel old. Uh, <laughs> But it, it's a really good point. I have a good friend of mine, first female graduating class of West Point, and 30 years in the Army. And she was starting her own business after she left it, consulting and doing stuff, and she refused to mention the fact that she had been in the Army and was first female graduating class of West Point. It's like, I think that sets you up as, somebody I'd want to talk to about how to handle adversity and conflict <laughs> and, and make it through, it, it adds your credibility. Absolutely. Yeah, so your absolutely. business minded, you use the credibility of Airbnb and PayPal and these courses you were running. So you brought some clients with in a way. Exactly. Yep, and, and a lot of people don't realize that. Is you, you're probably building elements of your side project right now without even knowing it, right? So if you can do all those things we talked about, find out what's play for you and work for other people, and then take any of that velocity you, you, you potentially have at work, combine all that into your next thing, and use it on your next venture, it's, it's just all about increasing your likelihood of survival, right? As you mentioned, most businesses fail, and it's true. And uh, a lot of people aren't prepared for that. So anything you can do to stack the deck in your favor and find that unfair advantage can be incredibly valuable. And that unfair advantage is really a fair advantage because you're going to be helping so many people down the road with the work you do. Because, as you said, for them it's work. Why not make their life easier? For so sure. That's a great way to think about it, yeah. How they can reach out to you? Sorry, say that again? Once again, just tell me how people can reach out to you and unless they can find uh, up on your site. Yep, we can, uh, yep we're at clickminded.com. Uh, we have a bunch of free uh, digital marketing strategy guides and SEO strategy guides for you there if you want to check it out. Um, or you can find me on Twitter at Tommy Griffith. I love it. Thank you so much for being here with me today and for sharing all of your insights. I, I really feel you gave my listeners so many different questions they need to be thinking about to really make their side gig a professional career for them. 
Yeah, thanks a lot, Laura. Oh, there's the music. Uh, yeah, I really appreciate the time, and thanks so much for having me on the show. Hey, thanks.